Hello, and welcome to the January Series 2020. My name is Christy Potter, and I'm the director of the series. And can you believe it? We're finally here. How quickly the time has come, and we are on day 15. It's been a really great 15 days, and I know many of you come, have come day after day to enjoy the presentations, and we've been inspired and challenged, and we've learned together. I hope that has been a blessing to all. And, <laughs> thank you. And while the series has been really great, it has also been a difficult few weeks on our campus as we unexpectedly face the death of two of our students. Friends, tomorrow is not guaranteed. Be sure to find the good in each day and love the people in your lives well. As we close out the 2020 season, I just want to say a special thanks once again to our series partners, Doug and Maria DeVos and Baker Publishing, our community partner, Meyer, our daily underwriters and creative partners, and those of you who sent in individual gifts, all helping to make this a free gift of the January series to all. We are really grateful. Thanks also to our technical teams and our event teams that, uh, for all their work behind the scenes, and the hosts of our 60 remote sites who have worked really hard this month. And now, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. I'm going to do mine. I expect you all to do yours, because we found that every day, people don't listen to us. <laughs> and we're betting that today is going to be the day. We're going to get it right. Um, and while you're doing that, I'd like to welcome the guests at all of our 60 remote sites watching, uh, in particular today, Spring, Texas, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Brampton, Ontario, and Bellevue, Washington. We're so grateful that you're all part of our audience. And now Joel Maidenblick, president of Calvin Theological Seminary, will get us started with prayer and introduce the Staub Lecture Series. Thanks. Thank you, Chrissy. Good afternoon. Today's presentation is also the Staub Lecture. The Staub Lecture is sponsored annually by Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary in honor of Dr. Henry Staub, who served so well as professor at both institutions. Dr. Staub taught from 1939 until 1975, except for the years when he served in the armed forces as a lieutenant in the United States Navy during World War II. The Staub Lecture is funded by the Henry Staub Endowment, and we again express our appreciation to the family of Dr. Henry Staub for their continued support and encouragement for these lectures. I would also note that at Kelvin Seminary at 4 p.m. today, we continue the conversation with the Staub Colloquium with our main speaker in an interview format uh, once again uh, at the Kelvin Seminary, 4 o'clock, refreshments available at 3.30. Uh, so you are all welcome. It uh, will be held at the Calvin Seminary Chapel. The president of Calvin University, Michael Roy, and myself as president of Calvin Seminary would also like to thank a committee that helps recognize Dr. Staub's contribution to the church and the kingdom of God and invites continued conversations in the fields of ethics, apologetics, and philosophical theology. Would you join me in prayer for this presentation as well, the journey that we've been on in the January series of 2020. Let's pray. Dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of time, and we thank you for the gift of the presentations that we have heard or experienced and can even go back to. We thank you for, once again, the staff who puts this all together. Thank you for Christie's gifts, and we thank you again for the January series. We are mindful of pain in this world. We are main, mindful of pain even in our neighborhoods and in this community. We pray again for the family and friends for you to bring comfort to the family and friends of Andrew Prezozios and Olivia Haverkamp. And as we hear the um, presentation about hopes and challenges in the Middle East, we pray again for your church in its various places, in its various forms, seeking to be once again your witness in this world and we thank you for the witness that this series is throughout the world. May all praise and all glory go to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now Emily Brinks, Research Specialist for the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, will introduce our guest. <clears throat> Najla Kassab 
received a Bachelor of Arts in Christian Education at the Near East School of Theology in Beirut, Lebanon, and her MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary here in the States. She has spent her life in ministry, especially in her home church, the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, one church in two countries. She has long served her church in women's ministry and Christian education, both in the churches and in the many day schools run by the church in both countries. She is one of only two women ordained in her church. I first met Najla in 2010, right here on Calvin's campus, when Calvin hosted the inaugural meeting of the World Communion of Reformed Churches. In 2017, she was elected president, and as president, she travels widely among the over 200 member denominations in over 100 countries. This past summer, I met her again in Lebanon at a women's conference she hosted to offer support and encouragement for about 100 women from Syria and Lebanon, plus a few of us who came from the States. Most were from Syria who came with wrenching stories of loss, the, con the continuing conflicts there. We lamented and laughed and learned much together. This is what Najla Kassab's ministry has been all about, listening, learning, offering support to churches in Syria and Lebanon and now around the world. We have much to learn from her. Najla Kassab will be available in the West Lobby to greet you following her presentation. Calvin University is grateful to the Staub Lecture Series for underwriting today's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Najla Kassab. What a joy to be here again, after 10 years. This is the place where my journey with World Communion of Reformed Churches started. And this is where I was elected on the executive committee of the World Communion of the Reformed Churches. So this place means a lot for me and for my journey. I bring you greetings of the World Communion where 100 million members come together to speak about how to be committed to the communion and committed to justice as well. We are in 110 countries in 233 churches around the world. And today is a special day to talk about the Middle East. And especially in the last two days, I was experiencing the pain that's happening in this country with the loss of uh, Kobe. Uh, I, you, you might not believe that. I myself used to be a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> but it's this pain, you know, that you see around in the TV and the pain that happened in the university, you know, with the losses. And it's a time to talk about how God is present in the, in the midst of pain. And I tell you how the God is present in the midst of the work of the church in the Middle East today. The Reformed Church in the Middle East, hopes and challenges. Albert Einstein, the well-known physicist, used to take daily the train from his home to work. One time, while he was traveling on the same train, the inspector for the tickets, tickets showed up and asked the passengers to show their tickets. He came close to Mr. Albert Einstein, and Mr. Albert was looking in his pocket. He could not find his ticket. So he came closer to him and said, after a few minutes, Mr. Einstein, I know you. You don't need to find your ticket. It's okay, I know you. And he left. Then he came back again, the inspector, and found that Albert Einstein was still looking for his ticket. 
And he said, Mr. Einstein, I told you, I know you, you don't need to do that. And then Albert stood up and said, and looked at him, I know who I am, but I'm looking for the ticket. I, know to, I need to know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we talk about the Reformed Church in the Middle East. It's important that we talk about the identity of the Reformed Church. What impact did the Reformed Church had in the past? But I believe, speaking about, it's important to speak about where we are going. What's our direction? What role did the Reformed Church have in the past is important. But I think it's as important as what the church has, what role it has now and will have in the future. What hopes and challenges is the Reformed Church facing? Where are we going? The Reformed Church in the Middle East has had several contributions to the culture in the Middle East, speaking mainly that, you know, indirectly about the contributions that happened in sharing the love of Christ in opening schools, hospitals, orphanages, or even having direct contribution in presenting the Reformed principles and thinking in a church that's called for living up to the continual Reformation, presenting a unique ecclesiastical paradigm in the Middle East. To be a church that wants to be to renewed, to be like her, her Lord, so that his kingdom on earth is lived as it is in heaven. The Reformed Church had its role to be the bridge that can help the Middle East be renewed. And its role was and is to be that bridge. I will speak about some of the contributions that happened in the past and what we're doing today. The first, and I think the most valuable contribution that the Reformed Church uh, shared in the Middle East was the education of women. Perhaps one of the prominent contributions made by the Reformed Church in the Middle East is educating women. And my presence here today is the result of that. And here, you know, Protestants were the first to open primary schools for educating girls in the Middle East. At a time when it was considered shameful for women to go to school, it has become shameful for women not to go to school, from whether in other denominations, sects, or religions. The Protestants opened the first school for girls in Beirut in 1835, which was known as the American Protestant School for Girls. This school still exists, but moved to another area in Rabie, where I live. Protestants were pioneers in empowering women, raising the status of women, giving them equal opportunities to learn, developing their capabilities, and engaging in issues of liberating Middle Eastern women, and I want to say also liberating Middle Eastern men for allowing women to live their talents and to learn and be good contributors in the society. There is no doubt that the role of Protestants in educating women opened the way for change in society because the awareness and self-realization of women is the basis of awareness for the coming generations. But I could say, I've read lately, a woman saying, the best way to defeat fundamentalism is to educate women. And I believe this step that was done by the Reformed Church in the Middle East, in Lebanon and in Syria and in other countries, has really changed the situation of women. And I believe this is one of the most complete contribution and most important contribution that happened. And 
another contribution that the Reformed Church did is empowering the role of women in the church. In addition to educating women, Protestants were the first to ordain women in the whole Middle East, and this happened two years ago. In a society where women are not in leadership in religious circles, whether among other churches or religions, the Reformed Church dared to take the step and to ordain two women. The National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, and I just want to clarify, we use the word evangelical in, to mean Protestant, uh, in, in the way the, the title is used, ordained two women as, as pastors for the ministry of word and sacrament. This step was an expression of God's justice and love, and witnessing to the good news that in Christ, there is no male and female. Galatians 3.28. The Reformed Church stepped in to impact society and other groups in, in this step. Perhaps the way the media received the news showed how important this topic is for the church in Lebanon and Syria. And I want to say, I will be focusing on my, in my talk on what is the Reformed Church doing mainly in Lebanon and Syria. And this is the area where I work. But for sure, the, Protestant, the Reformed Church has a great role in Egypt as well, who are part of the World Communion of Reformed Churches, and also in Iran. The ordination challenged other churches. It allowed the discussion about where are women in the leadership of the church to start I remember one of my friends came to me from other evangelical churches, and she said, you know, Najla, the, the ordination uh, of you and the other, of Rula, triggered issues in our church, where women, and uh, she's a friend from the Baptist church, women don't go to the general assembly of that church. She said, after the ordination, women started to go to the general assembly. Also, she said, in my church, men will sit on one side and, and women on the other side. For the first time after the ordination, you know, men and women, even husband and wife, could sit together. This step has raised the issue and the discussion. And I believe that's very important. That, and it's the time for churches to think about where are women in leadership in churches. Today, we have three women who are ordained from another church uh, that's part of the communion. And there's a fourth one in Syria who will hope will be ordained soon and many others who are getting ready. Another contribution of the Reformed Church is education and publication. And this is where, you know, uh, the, the Reformed Church focused not only on educating women, but also in education as a whole. And we all understand how the Reformation has encouraged education because the Reformation stressed that every believer should read his and her Bible. And this is where schools were open to help people read the Bible. And it created this new move about the importance of education. Therefore, Protestants believed in establishing schools side by side to churches to teach people to read and write so they could read the Bible and at the same time they could read and, and be able uh, active in society. One of the prominent contributors for, uh, of Protestants in the Middle East is uh, opening a school in 1843 uh, where Butrus al-Bustani, a well-known thinker, one of the most important professors known, he, he taught there, and also there was another school opened in Beirut, and then in Su'el Gharb, and then in Sidon, and several schools were open. And I believe now, as a synod, we teach around 6,900 students in Lebanon, and the majority of them are not Christian. And in these schools, you know, it's, I always say these are the better pulpit of sharing the love of Christ 
with every person, of sharing, helping people to learn, is a great message of love in that. Protestants also have universities in Lebanon. They started what's known today as the American University of Beirut that has shaped Lebanon. I think uh, many people would say, if we subtract the American University in Beirut out of our history, Lebanon will look like a different country. And also we have another LAU, the Lebanese American Univer University, that also taught women and is a, an important university in shaping the society. We also have Haigazian University and University of the Middle East. Four uh, universities, uh, not all of them are run by Protestants, but I believe this is our heritage and this is the impact that this minority church could have on a nation. And we thank God for this history and this role. Also, Protestants were in, uh, interested in publication. In 1834, the Protestants transferred their press established in Malta to Beirut, which had a prominent role in the publication in Lebanon. So the American printing press began in printing activity, and uh, it started to print the Bible in Arabic, Turkish, Armenian, Hebrew, Greek, Kurdish, and Spanish, and it had an important role in meeting the school's needs for books. In 1900, Protestants established also reading rooms in several areas, encouraging education. The other uh, contribution that the Reformed Church had is this uh, social work, the contribution of the Reformed Church in social work. The Reformed Church was well, not limited to churches only, and schools and universities, but also had hospitals, headed by what's known today as the American University Hospital in Beirut, and another hospital that's not functioning anymore. It's called the Asfuriye, which is a place for mental uh, challenges. And uh, also we have Hamlin Hospital, that's running as an, uh, as an elderly home today. And we have uh, Luke Center, St. Luke Center, and we have also Mauadiyye Center. So the church is involved also in social work, reaching out to many in the community. In Lebanon, the evangelical community in general, which means not only Reformed, but Baptists and the Church of God, the whole community is around 400,000. And in Syria, it is almost the same, around 400,000. But I want to say this minority small church impacts more than 400,000 through our schools and hospitals and uh, uh, several organizations that we talked about. This was what, where we historically were and this is where we are still in these services of schools. And I will talk more about the value of these organizations in our ministry today. The Reformed Church has a great role also in the ecumenical movement. Although Reformation led to the emergence of a new church, and even other churches in the line of the Reformation. Knowing that Le we all know that Luther did not want to start a new church, but because of he was excommunicated, the, there was the start of the Reformed Church. However, the Protest Protestants are founders of the ecumenical movement in the Middle East and has a leading role in ecumenism in the world today. As we look closely at the Reformed principles, we find that the ecumenical work is natural development for our basic principles of the Reformation. It's no wonder that Protestant Church is a pioneer in the field of ecumenical work. The principle, for example, of the priesthood of all believers advocated by, uh, by the Reformation focuses that everyone who knows Christ 
and unites in him is responsible for building the body of Christ. With this teaching, thus all believers have a role in the church. And this allows people to come together in service and in being responsible members in the body of Christ. That's the church focuses on service in a non-authoritative setting, far from hierarchical structures. So that the, church, the strength of the church lies in the ministry, not in the office of the clergy. And the ministry of all the members. This understanding calls for partnership in service. And so members in the Reformed Church who are brought up with this teaching that you have a role in building the body of Christ. And we all have a role. When we are raised in this, we are called to open up to other churches and that we together, we can, uh, you know, work together, serve together, and minister together. Therefore, whenever the Protestant understood their identity, they became more ecumenical. Whether with other churches, Catholic, Orthodox, or even with other neighbors and religion. This is because we believe that ecumenism is far from one church dominating the others. And I was discussing this in one of the classes. Ecumenism is opening up, is sharing the love of Christ, and learning together with the other churches and communities about how we can live the love of Christ today. So ecumenism is wealth. It's not submission. It's not, you know, submitting to any authority, but learning together how we can be the church of Christ today. Today, the, the Reformed Church is very much involved in the Middle East in the ecumenical work. We are called to reevaluate our ecumenical role in the Middle East and strive to bring about a continuous reform in our, in our understanding of ecumenical work. We are challenged to recognize that Protestant reform was radical and its beginning. And probably now we are not into this situation. It's a time to discuss together about how we can enrich each other as churches. We are in a new phase and we are called to move away from reactions and start opening to the wealth that exists in other churches. In the Middle East, as a community, there were Christians are a minority. It's very important that churches work together and to learn together and to open up on ways that we can live what Christ wants from us. At the same time, in ecumenism, we are challenged not to compromise our identity. Because many times, some people think in compromising our identity, we have better ecumenism. And I believe that's wrong. It's a time in ecumenism where we share our identity in openness. I believe as a reformed church in the Middle East, we have a rich heritage that we can share with other churches. Whether that is related to our non-hierarchical structures, and I think that's a blessing that we can share in the Middle East. Or the role of laity. Or the role of women. Or openness and accepting difference. This, this is a, a great heritage that we are called to share in relating to other churches. And I believe this is the wealth that we have as a Reformed Church. And I will be speaking more about it in sharing it, it will renew the Middle East. It will renew us all. The Reformed Church is in a minority in the Middle East. But still, we can be a light to the Middle East. I always think that minority is not a word that means weakness. Minor minority could be powerful when we have committed people who are ready to live 
their faith in the right way. So what the church did through the years, as a minority, they were, the church was able to change lots of things in our society in Lebanon and in Syria. And today, uh, the other churches are struggling with issues that the Reformed Church struggled with 502 years ago. And this is a time important to share that, whether it's the role of women, whether it's the role of laity, and it's important that this discussion be shared in our ecumenical encounter. There is no impactful church today without an, ecu an active ecumenical encounter. An a, encounter that trespasses boundaries and that, that have separated us from others and from different people who are on the same journey of living God's kingdom on earth. There is no doubt that what Protestants have done in the past is a legacy, an impressive legacy if we compare the number of Protestants with their contribution and influence in the Middle East, in the Eastern culture. The institutions that Protestants launched contributed to the shaping of the countries. But this legacy places a heavy burden on our shoulders. And to not merely admire what we did in the past, but we, what we should do today and in the future. Especially because today some of our institutions are, have been closed. Some of them are not run by Protestants, as I mentioned. It's a time that we appreciate the past, but it's a time to think of what we can do today and to think how we can be impactful for a better Middle East for the future. I will share with you some of the ideas about how can the church, what, why is the church, Reformed Church, important in the Middle East today? You know, some people, as we all understand, the concept of mission has changed in the world today. And sometimes people say, feel like, oh, we've done a mistake in the Middle East in having a Reformed Church there. And I want to say to them, no, it's not a mistake. It's a church that, that did impact in the past and will impact the, the other churches and the nation in the future. I will share some of the principles that I see very valuable in our role as Reformed Church in the Middle East. The concept of continual reformation is a very important you know, understanding that's needed in our life in the Middle East. Although reformation started in 1517, it's important importance and impact lies in living up the continual reformation. We all know it's not enough to talk about the past, but we are called to live this continuity, continual reformation in the light of the word of God. The church is called to scrutinize its life in the light of interpreting the word of God. The church is called for constant evaluation, questioning on how we live the gospel and be renewed as we share the good news. Reform is a daily need, a constant revival. At that time, probably the medieval church at that time thought that they were all right. And then they discovered that there was a counter-reformation that happened, that the church was changing. The church needs constant reform. Just what Luther says, we need a daily uprising, a daily repentance of sometimes that the way that we behave as Christians. Luther said that as a Christian, we are called to look at our life and evaluate it and to live this continual reformation. I want to say that 
that teaching is very important for the Middle East. It's very important that all churches take the element of evaluation very seriously. If you look at the life of the churches today and compare them, of the Reformed churches today, and compare them to the year 1823 when the Reformed churches started in the Middle East, we will find that there is great similarity still the same way it was in 1823, whether it's in worship sometimes, or in sequence or activities. And we find that it's time to reevaluate our worship, to reevaluate how we impact young people in our congregations, to check on our theology, to check on our how we do ministry. And this is one of the challenges, and I'm so happy for the worship you know, symposium, about coming together and speaking how we can worship in a way that is impactful. Some people think that to reserve the Reformed identity is to keep things the way they are, the way we receive them from the missionaries. And I believe we miss understanding for the continual reformation. We are called upon to share the principle of continuous reform in society, and in the church, and to engage in pointing to all that is unjust and contradicts God's will for his people. A life of repentance, as Luther says, is what God expects from us. A life in which every day brings a new challenge, and every second in which it urges us to rethink, to re-examine things, and to be there to be renewed. I believe continual reformation uh, it is a need in the Middle East and is needed in, in the way individuals live their life and in the way the church lives its life. And away from continual reformation, we will be missing, you know, the whole concept of reformation. It's not the past, it's this continuity of rechecking and reforming. And I think this ought to be shared by the people around us as a Reformed Church. Another important aspect is Reformation teaches on accountability. Accountability contributes for rebuilding a better Middle East. Someone said that the most important thing that Reformation taught us was accountability. If we look closely at church life, we find that the authority in any place in the Reformed Church is held accountable. And I think that's very precious in our understanding because, you know, no matter who we are in the church, we are held accountable. Whether it's a pastor or a lay person, Therefore, decisions are governed, governed by groups in committees, not individuals. There is no doubt, no doubt that this pattern of administration is new to religious institutions in the Middle East. And it's called to equal responsibility of the, for the priesthood of all believers in building the body of Christ. And that Christ is the only head of the church. This and teaching about accountability is a valuable part of our identity. And I believe we could contribute in a better uh, Middle East seat in this. Despite that, sometimes this concept is misused in the church. Because sometimes the lay people feel like they are the only ones who can hold the pastor accountable. And they forget that they themselves are held accountable as well. One of the things that I learned, that if I'm a volunteer, it doesn't mean that I'm not ac held accountable. And this mentality of accountability helps the church to be rebuilt together. Or sometimes we fall in mistakes where some pastors think that they are beyond accountability. Who dares to ask questions for the pastor? 
Accountability protects the church from human missteps and makes us responsible and accountable. So we protect the church from slipping into corruption, neglect, or stagnation as well. We are challenged to see leadership not as having power, but as shared participation, away from authoritarian and um, models of dictators. The more the group tends to be ignorant, I think the more we are ignorant about our reformed identity, we fall into this kind of wrong practices. In the Reformed Church, we are all held accountable, and that's what helps us to continually reform and evaluate, and dare to say that I've not done well, and I, we could do things in a better way. Today, we are required for a new reform in terms of accountability, because there is no revival in the church without accountability. But accountability confirms that serving in the church is a serious task where God will ask if we were really faithful or not. This is uh, according to the concept of accountability that many times is absent. I, want, I wonder if some of you are watching the news about what's happening in Lebanon. When in the Lebanese streets, the young people are, have an uprise mainly to hold the leaders accountable. Our leaders, and this has been for 100 days, where the young people, you know, have asked the leaders to be, especially with the difficult economic situation that the country is going through. And I believe this understanding of accountability, it builds the Middle East. Because the main ISIS in the Middle East is corruption. And in accountability, we are all protected from corruption. It is the church, the Reformed Church, has a big responsibility in this teaching about accountability and in sharing our relations with others. Another element is pluralism. Accepting others contributes for a better Middle East. You know, in the churches in the, life of, in the line of the Reformation, another important aspect is that, you know, for example, the evangelical community in Lebanon, we are different, we have different stands. We come together as a, you know, evangelical community, but we have learned that some churches have different practices, different polity, different interpretations, but we accept one another. I believe living in the line of the Reformation, we grow to accept difference and to accept pluralism, you know, not as something negative, but as something that, you know, I know you think differently, but I accept you as a person. And I believe this is part of what the Reformation, you know, the trends of an interpretation that were allowed, have created this community that's not the same, different, but they accept one another. According to be raised in the Reformed tradition, family, people are brought to respect, respect difference and uh, accept others even when they don't think exactly the same. For example, we have the Presbyterians, or we have the Congregational, and the Lutherans, and the Episcopalians, you know, that have differences, but we are all, you know, come under an umbrella uh, in the Middle East that's called the Evangelical Churches together. We have learned to accept pluralism, and I believe one of the main issues that's needed in the Middle East today is accepting pluralism. That you'd think differently, but I accept you. And this is a rich teaching as a church that we have, we have, and we need to share it with other churches in that. Pluralism, accepting the others, the other who is different, contributes for a better 
Middle East. Also, the principle of the priesthood of all believers and their role of laity. I believe we are blessed that in the Reformed Church, laity have a role. Lay people have an important role. And this is where, when you are in the body of Christ, everyone has a role. And I believe this role of laity is something very valuable that could impact other churches and could help you know, uh, everybody to have a role in the church. Luther came preaching with a new church where everybody is involved, where every person is involved. And unfortunately, many times we have fallen short from our understanding of priesthood of all believers. Because some people come to churches as spectators. They just watch without having their own personal role in building the body of Christ. This is why, you know, to, to, be in the, uh, to have be in the, in the uh, priesthood of all believers, every laity have a role. And this is a blessing that we have in our churches. But many times, uh, we have changed that people feel like, oh, I just come to church to hear the pastor. And I forget about what's my role in the church, in building the church. This is, uh, we are all responsible. When the church does well, it's because, because all of us. And when the church does not do well, it's not only the fault of the pastor. It's the fault of all of us not taking our role and place in the priesthood of all believers as very important. Uh, we are proud that we are in a church that where laity have an important role. As a church today, we, ca we are called to affirm this pattern and re-educate our children about the necessity of living in the priesthood of all believers. We are members in the church, but every one of us has an important role. The Reformed Church has an important role also in encouraging dialogue. You know, as I mentioned to you, we have several schools where Muslims and Christians, they grow together in our schools and they have a dialogue of life. One of the richness in living in the Middle East that we grow with other religions. As a child, a Muslim has always been my friend. I studied with him or her. And that allows a dialogue of life that is very important. I believe the church in the Middle East has this role in creating places where people who are diverse have a dialogue of life. I know in one of our churches in Syria, there is even in the middle of the Syrian war, they have a program called Space for Hope, where people who are from different religions come together and play football, Christians and Muslims. And this space of hope have kept that community to dialogue together, even in the midst of war. And I believe our church has a very important role in encouraging dialogue. Another important aspect, the time is running, is that Reformed Church encourages moderation against radicalism. And I want to say what's happening here in the world. The issue is not, you know, the moderate Muslim or the moderate Christian. The issue is the radical Muslim who's not ready to dialogue with me. The same way with the radical Christian who's not ready to, or the radical Jewish. Radicalism one of the suffering that the church is facing today is radicalism in the Middle East, where, you know, we are challenged on how we can retain the moderate aspect of religions. You know, a religions of love, whether it's Christian, Muslim, or Jewish. Violence encourages radicalism. And this is why the more we use violence in the Middle East, or outside the Middle East, the more radical groups grow around. The world is stuck with attitudes of fear 
and radicalism. And as a church, we believe, Reformed Church, we have a role in encouraging moderation where people can sit together and talk together. Last, I would like to tell you a story about a carpenter who visited a farm and knocked the door while the farmer was there and he, he, the carpenter told him, I would like to help if you have some woodwork for me. So the farmer said, yes, I want you to build a fence around my farm. But I have to go and then I will come back to see you finishing the work. So the farmer left and after a few weeks came back to the farm, looked from far and he could not find the fence. He was very angry and he told him, what have you done all these weeks? And the carpenter said, I want to tell you the truth. While I was building the fence, I learned from the neighbors that you had a fight with your brother. So I changed my mind and I felt you don't need a fence, you need a bridge. So I have built a bridge where you can go and reach out for your brother. Friends, today lots of walls in the world, lots of walls in the Middle East and it's time where the church is involved in building bridges. It's a time that we are, we are in the Middle East to be a church that's ready to, bring, to build bridges with the different people and to be able to be a bridge. The main witness of the Reformed Church is to be a bridge of reconciliation among religions and brothers and sisters. Now, after the war in Syria, that's not finished yet, our main concern is how do we bring reconciliation? How do we help these people to have bridges of reconciliation? And I believe we are a minority group, but we have a big role in building bridges of reconciliation. Christian witness is living up to reconciliation. And I believe the world needs reconciliation. The world needs that we lessen our efforts in building walls and try to build bridges that can help people to come together, to talk and to find solutions together. I want to say, despite the challenges that we have of, of pain that we have in the Middle East, the Reform, Reformed Church is blessed to be there and God has used us in the past, will continue to use us as bridges of reconciliation. Thank you. I'm Karen Sapi from the English department, and uh, you can, if you're listening and can't see the screen, you can email questions to askjseries at calvin.edu or tweet them to the hashtag askjseries. Uh, st let me start with the question, um, what's your ultimate hope for, for Muslims? Is it, do, do you see it as part of the role of the Christian church to bring Muslims to see Jesus as the Messiah, or is it enough to to work with them and let God do the rest. Yeah. You know, as Christians, we are called to lift up Christ in our life. And we have a wonderful dialogue of life with Muslims in Lebanon. You know, we grew, before the Lebanese war, I would not know who was a Muslim and who was a Christian. It was the war that created these divisions in that. As a church, we share the love of Christ with them we, we respect them and we try in our life that they see Christ in us and uh, to enjoy the culture together and to, in, to work together on lessening radicalism 
in that because radicalism will destroy both of us, whether we are Christians or Muslims. They are our neighbors. And as I mentioned before, the issue is not with Islam. The issue is with radical Islam. And, and this is where uh, we worry that uh, radical Islam, if it grows, it will divide people and will, bring, will build more walls than bridges. There's a question here about how, here we go. What moral, political, and financial support is available to Palestinian Christians living in Israel and the West Bank from Reformed churches? You know, uh, in March, we will be, as the World Community of Reformed Churches, the issue, the issue of Palestinian cause is at the heart of our strategic plan as a communion. Although we feel we need to do more, People cannot, the Palestinians cannot wait too long with the suffering that they have been through. So sometimes one of the difficulties is just uh, being slow in helping the Christians there and empowering them. Uh, I'm afraid that with the many problems that are happening in the Middle East, the Palestinian issue is forgotten. And uh, the church there is struggling, the poverty of the church there. So it's a time, we always say, to solve the issue of peace in the Middle East is related to what's happening in Israel-Palestine. And we don't want to see this injustice continue as a church. We have to speak against it, and as churches we have to be committed to help these churches to survive and to have a dignified life. We should not forget no solution without peace. And we should keep pressing, and we don't have all the time. We should take that seriously in our churches. Thank you. Uh, does Lebanon accept Syrian refugees right now? You know, Lebanon is around, has around 4, 000, uh, 4 million uh, inhabitants. We have around 1,500,000 refugees. I want to say, at the beginning, it wasn't easy to accept the Syrian refugees, but they are our neighbors, and when the Lebanese were struggling, Syria opened the door for the Lebanese as well. But now, uh, the crisis of the situation of Syrians in Lebanon, and uh, that's not moving forward, you know. A few of them left because the economic situation in Lebanon became bad, mm -hmm. Uh, but still, uh, one of the issues uh, that's very urgent is to solve the issue of refugees, Syrian refugees, whether it's in Lebanon or outside Lebanon uh, in that. Uh, at the beginning, it was difficult. Now they are there. We want to help them. We cannot but help them in a, a human way, you know, to, ha to retain their dignity. And I want to say, as a church, we are proud that we have opened schools for Syrian refugee children who have nothing to do, you know, they could be on the streets, they can be, pay a big price, so we try to retain their dignity uh, in that. Uh, we hope that the Syrian refugees could go home for a dignified life. We hope that their houses that are hit could be rebuilt mm -hmm. and uh, to solve the issue to stop the war in Syria, because the war is not finished in Syria, and to be able to, to do something. I'm afraid that sometimes they are held hostage for political agendas. And we, we hope that the issue of the Syrian refugees is solved soon. As always, way too many great questions coming in. Um, <laughs> but I think I'll ask this one. Who is someone in the Bible that you find yourself relating to? The Canaanite woman. <laughs> Say more? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. A woman from my country. <laughs> yeah. um, can you say more about that? I mean, uh, are there very specific ways or is it, is it um, broadly? Yeah, it's, it's, 
it's people who are marginalized, you know, women mm -hmm. who are marginalized, and, and God calls them in, in the middle. You, I, I would have liked to ask so many questions about your being one of the first women ordained in the Middle East. Though when uh, Elizabeth Eaton was elected bishop of the ELCA, um, she was asked over and over, what's it like to be the first woman? And she said, I look forward to a time when nobody's asking that question. <laughs> yes, me too. How, let me land with this one. In what ways can the church here in the United States and North America support the church in Lebanon best? I believe what we are doing now is a way of supporting the church in the Middle East. Hearing the story. You know, sometimes we hear the news that doesn't carry the full story. Mm -hmm. It's time to uh, hear the people who are living there, to hear their struggle. And I think that's important, and I will appreciate what's done, what's to, uh, happening today. At the same time, I want to say, as a synod, we did not encourage Christians to leave the Middle East. So many of our partners in the USA helped in supporting, uh, uh, providing funds, in allowing people to have rent, food, all the you know, basic needs to have basic humanitarian, you know, dignified life. And this happened in the past, and I think we will need our partners more when we think of reconciliation. After the war, that's the more difficult time. How do you rebuild the trust among the same nations in that? Uh, also, the church here could, is our voice, you know, especially uh, when, when the church speaks on our behalf as well, with unjust policies or unjust actions in that. And we have always had this wonderful uh, relation among the churches in the Middle East and the churches here where we support one another and try to hear things from our perspectives, you know, from the perspective of the people living there and the perspectives of the people living in the U.S. and have this dialogue together. Thank you. Najla will be in the West Lobby to greet you after this presentation. I want to say thank you to the Staub Lecture Series for underwriting today's presentation, to Christy Potter and the January Series staff for wearing us out with wonderful presentations and conversations. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for being here. We'll see you next year. Students and yeah, faculty, go get some rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much. Very God much. bless you. Thank you.